Please join me in welcome our, welcoming our student honorees for 2019. Please be seated. Good evening again. On behalf of the Town of Brookhaven Black History Commission, we'd like to welcome you to our 2019 Black History Night program. We'd like to thank you for joining us. At this time, I would ask I would ask Reverend Jones from Christ Baptist Church of Quorum to please bring us the invocation. Shall we pray? Eternal and everlasting God, the master of ocean and of earth and of sky, See, we have gathered in this place this evening to take a retrospective look back into the month of February, which is known to us as Black History Month. We ask tonight, oh God, that you would speak to us in your divine power. Let us know that you are a God of all righteous, all understanding and knowledge. We thank you tonight for this place to come and share together one with another. And we ask your divine blessings upon the super, supervisor of this town of Brookhaven. Not only the supervisor, but of those that have worked so diligently to bring to pass this program tonight. Sometimes we look back, oh God, in retrospect and wonder how we made it over. But I'm so grateful tonight to you for your written word that was spoken and said, I am God. I will do a new thing. We thank you for what you are doing, what you have done, and what you will do in the future. And we know from your word that we cannot survive on the past, but we must press toward the mark of a higher calling of God in Christ Jesus. Bless us, for you are the God that can make ways out of no ways in the desert. You can put rivers in the desert. You can bring highways in the sea. And we thank you tonight. Bless this congregation, each one, one by one, and collectively. And we give your name all the praise, the glory, and honor is always yours. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Jones. At this time, we'd ask everyone to stand, if you are able, and please join us uh, in singing Lift Every Voice and Sing.
Thank you. You may be seated. My name is Jennifer Martin. On behalf of the Town of Brookhaven Black History Commission, we are so delighted that you could join us tonight for our 2019 Black History Celebration. Uh, the Commission was so excited when we heard this year's theme, National Black History Night theme, Black History Month theme, Black Migrations. And no matter where you come from, whether you were born in the United States, whether you were born uh, somewhere around the globe, we all have incredible migration stories, uh, whether it's your personal story, whether it's your family story, um, everyone can relate to this theme. So we are so excited to share this night with you. We are incredibly proud of our student honorees uh, for their academic excellence. We are incredibly proud of the uh, community organization and our keynote speaker that we are honoring tonight, um, Shadrach Boyachi, as well as the Bethel Harms Bethel Hobbs Community Farm. Um, so at this time, I'd just like to make a few acknowledgments. Um, I would like to acknowledge some of our uh, elected officials that have joined us this evening. Uh, you will certainly be hearing from our supervisor, Edward Romaine, who is always a champion and a supporter of black history. And we thank him so much. Uh, Councilwoman Valerie Cartwright, who is our commission liaison, you will also hear from her as well. Also, our council members that were unable to be here with us tonight, uh, but Councilwoman Jane Bonner was here. She was feeling a little ill, um, and we appreciate her support, as well as Councilman Kevin Laval. We thank them for coming and cheering on our students and their honorees. We would also like to acknowledge uh, a very special group of people who always support our Black History Night program. Uh, the Gordon Heights Fire Department, um, they are here every year without fail, and we'd like to acknowledge uh, Second, Ass Second Assistant Chief Rivers, Ex-Chief Dean, Captain Forrest, Chaplain Gordon, and Lieutenant Simpson. Thank you so much for coming. We would also like to recognize the number of school administrators who have joined us tonight to support their students. Um, I saw a number of school officials, school board members, school administrators. If you are in any of those categories, we ask you to please stand so that we can recognize you as well. Thank you, thank you so much. We truly appreciate your support of our students. So at this time, it is my pleasure uh, to ask Supervisor Edward P. Romaine to give us some opening remarks. Thank you, Supervisor. Welcome to Town Hall. This is our 28th annual Black History Night that we've had in the town. You look at the photos that were placed up on the screen as they sang, Lift Every Voice. Black History Month is a month for us to reflect on the past and the struggle and the sorrow and the difficulty that those who came before us particularly those African Americans suffered and struggled and eventually succeeded. Tonight the topic is migration. We have two honorees, Shadrach, who is from Liberia, a country that many former slaves founded a country whose capital is named for President Monroe, a country that uses the American dollar as their currency, a country that nevertheless was mired in civil war. He came here. He's a successful playwright. He's an author. I think his, his latest uh, production was uh, uh, African Viva. He is someone that has succeeded. He is someone in the arts that knows how to use the pen 
and they say the pen is mightier than the sword. And the Bethel Hobbs farm. Mr. Hobbs came from Georgia into 1906. Believe me, Suffolk County was very different in 1906. And he settled in North Center Reach and started a farm. And he passed that farm to his son James in 1955. Just as Center Reach was booming and strip development was taking place and houses were going up left and right, but he did not sell the farm. And then he passed it along in the 1990s and he remembered AME Bethel Church and he gave it to them. The farm fell into disrepair, but in 2007, a group of people got together and restored the farm. And to this day, it produces food and it's the center of a lot of activity, including a run that's sponsored by Councilman Laval. So we look at, at these two honorees, and they kind of speak about migration. For those who study American history, the greatest migration in our country's history is the migration of African Americans. First from southern farms to southern cities, and then to the northeast, Midwest, to the west. It is the greatest movement of people in this country by any group or none. And that migration took place mainly between 1900 and 1970. And it changed this country. It helped promote diversity. And despite all the difficulties, we are a country that is multicultural. We are a country that is multiracial. We are a country that has come a long way in terms of guaranteeing rights. We are a country that still has a long way to go. We are still a country working towards a better life for all, ensuring that everyone enjoys what liberty and freedom has to offer. And if there's one group that no one ever has to lecture about liberty and freedom is Afro-Americans, because most of those who came to this country came against their will, came when slavery was still accepted. To this day, to this day, for anyone who has had to live, and they're still in many parts of this world today, evil places where there are slavery and oppression. Freedom and liberty are words that mean something. I thank God that I live in a country that though not perfect, is working towards perfection. And that perfect day comes when we love our neighbor as ourselves. That perfect day is coming when we see and we judge people, not by the color of their skin or their religion, but by the content of their character. We just celebrated a national holiday for a tremendous leader who we lost so early in life. I think he was only 39, Martin Luther King, Jr. One day, if you ever have spare time, listen to the videos of his speeches. Listen to the words and understand that words have power. And the words of freedom and liberty the words that our country was founded, we still have to live up to. God bless all those who promote freedom and liberty for all, that promote justice for all, that promote equality for all, that promote brotherhood for all, and most important, that promote compassion for all. God bless all of you.
Let's leave here determined in our little house, in our little neighborhood, in our little street to build a better world. God bless you. I, I would be remiss if I did not thank Jennifer Martin, who is the chairperson, and all those who served. Could all the committee members who served on the committee stand up? They're in the back, but thank you guys. Thank you very much. Two other announcements. Juneteenth is going to be, we, as supervisor, I instituted that the town will celebrate Juneteenth about four years ago. We have a picnic every Juneteenth. This year will be June 15th uh, at the Longwood Estate. And picnic's free. Please come, enjoy. And lastly, my great thanks to the Gordon Heights Fire Department. This is a community that was founded by people from New York City by a Lewis Fife that sold lots there in 1929. It is a historic community and it is an historic firehouse and fire district for which great respect is due. Thank you for serving as our color guard. God bless you all. Good evening. My name is Valerie Cartwright. I'm a councilwoman in the town of Brookhaven. I'm also the liaison. I have the pleasure of serving as the liaison for the Black History Commission. Um, thank you for coming this evening and joining us um, for our 2019 Black History Night, where we celebrate our amazing young people and their academic successes. As we sit here today, it's easy to take for granted the freedom that we have and take for granted the journey that our families were on to get us here today. Um, I'm of Haitian descent, um, first, American, first generation American, and most recently, I'll say probably in the past 10 years, I've been talking to my parents trying to trace back all of my history and when, you know, when, when did our ancestors um, come here from Haiti? Um, when did they come to Haiti from Africa? And all of that, we need to do that more often. So as I have all the young people behind me, make sure you take the opportunity to talk to your family while they're here to learn your own personal family history because that is all part of this story of migration and it is all part of our freedom and our journey as we approach 2020. So over this course of centuries long slave trade, upwards of 12 million African people were taken from their homes in Africa against their will and forced into slavery in the Americas. Fewer than half a million of those enslaved were brought to North America. The vast majority were transported to South America and the Caribbean. This was the greatest forced migration in history. This migration brought with it diverse ethnic and linguistic groups that had a significant impact on the culture of the new world in which they settled. As you all know, both laws and traditional practice govern the segregation of the South following the emancipation. Discrimination in every form denied black people housing, access to public institutions, and basic civil rights. This systematic segregation provided a driving force behind the desire and the need for African Americans to leave the South. During the Great Migration, 1.5 million black Americans fled the repression of underpaid and degrading jobs, being denied the right to vote to change their leadership, Jim Crow laws, and the daily threat of violence. When they left the South in hopes of finding more opportunity and a brighter future for their families, millions of African Americans significantly changed this country, the country that we live in today, in ways we continue to see each and every day. The Great Migration introduced northern cities to the diversifying influence of African American music, art forms, cuisine, churches, religions, literature, and various inventions. In relocating to the North, blacks were afforded the opportunity to explore their individual paths to greatness, no longer weighed down by the restrictions and discrimination of the Jim Crow South. 
They brought with them the knowledge of the injustices that they left behind and sought to educate and organize to fight against them. They became the parents of a new generation of African American born and, born and raised in the North. As a result of the Civil Rights Movement and the subsequent Supreme Court decisions and legislative changes that brought about the end of Jim Crow, it resulted in a migration from some black Americans back to the South. Although discrimination and violence towards blacks still existed in the South, it was no longer condoned by law. The overwhelming social and political changes brought about by the Civil Rights Movement opened doors to new opportunities in the South as a destination for another migration. There were opportunities done in the North and the South. And when we think about it, we tend to think of the story of black people in America in two chapters. The years of enslavement and the struggle and perseverance of the Civil Rights Movement. Tonight, let's focus on what's really imperative. Imperative to celebrate the many decades in between and since. The resistance and resilience that defines our history, our black history, our American history. The 2019 Black History Month theme, Black Migrations, highlights the history of persons of African descent and their complex journeys to freedom. So as I was speaking, I saw that many people were watching all of the slideshows to my right, which give highlights of the history of migration over the years. But then if you look behind me, you see all of the young people that are part of our history here today. They are making history here in Brookhaven, and when they graduate, they will be making history across the country. If we can give them a round of applause, because it is about them. So we hope that when you leave here this evening, after hearing from all of our young people who are going to come up and tell you a little bit about themselves, that you will learn something new. Reinforce what you already know and learn something new about the migration of our people. And for the young people behind me, I hope that you leave here with a desire to learn more about your own personal history and take that and teach another. Each one teach one. So with that, enjoy the rest of the evening and I will ask Jennifer Martin to please come back up and continue the program. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Cartwright. So at this time, we are going to recognize the first of our honorees for this evening. Um, we are so excited uh, to have members of the Bethel Hobbs Farm Board of Directors, uh, the farm management, members of the Bethel AME Church here with us tonight to celebrate. So I'm going to ask if they would please come forward. Please join me in welcoming them. So when we thought about the 2019 theme, uh, Black Migrations, we wanted to uh, look locally at um, those that had migrated uh, here in our community. Um, and one of the first names that came up was the Bethel Hobbs Community Farm and the story of Mr. Hobbs. Um, and the Bethel Hobbs Farm has been a gathering place, has been a community center. Um, it's, it's been a place where people learn all about uh, farming and agriculture and also a, a community. And it's been uh, a location that has helped develop a sense of place for that particular area within Brookhaven. Um, so at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce Ann Pellegrino, uh, Larry Corbett. Uh, I'd like you to also introduce the other members of, of Justin Bailey and any of the other members of the church, of the Bethel Church that are here. We'd like to ask uh, you to say uh, a few words about the farm at this time. Greetings, 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 and uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Muratari, because your comments really, I think, lead into what Bell the Hobbs Farm is all about. People coming together, regardless of color, to further the legacy of Mr. Albert Hobbs. 
So just before I just make a couple comments, and then the person who really drives the farm and Paula Greenman will speak for a couple minutes, and then Justin Bailey also. But uh, my wife is there, Leslie Corbett. She's a member of Bethel Amy Church, and she helps out uh, with us at the farm. And then uh, Mr. Her Thank you. Uh, Mr. Herman Walker is over there, and he had the actual experience of actually knowing and working with Mr. Uh, Hobbs. So we thank you for that. And then uh, Greta, his daughter, is there, and she works now on the farm with us with our farm stand. And then um, Greg Pellegrino, uh, Ann's uh, second half, <laughs> also uh, works a lot on the farm and, and takes care when we have major issues with our farm equipment. Um, I'm going to let Ann do main talking because she really knows a lot about the farm. I had a chance to get involved. Uh, I met Mr. Hobbs briefly uh, just before he passed on at our church. And I didn't realize all that he had done. But now uh, going back and reviewing the history and looking at all he's done, uh, the, the legacy left was that of a man of uh, honesty and passion, uh, but more so generosity. So Mr. Hobbs did a lot of things to not only run the farm and make money, but to give back to the community. And at that time, again, when he was very involved in it, it was, again, a very multicultural situation, which I'm appreciative of. And then at some point in time, again, the farm went in a dormant stage after he had devoted the uh, will of the farm to uh, our church. And uh, a person stepped up, and that's Ann Pellegrino. She stepped up in a farm that had been abandoned by our community in terms of our church and saw Mr. Hobbs' vision of the legacy of this farm being a place for all people to be there and do things together. So um, with that, I'm just going to let her come over. And I'll just say two things. We've left in your agenda here a brief history of Mr. Hobbs. And there's a farm sheet about the farm and all that we do. And uh, we need volunteers. We need to continue Mr. Hobbs' legacy and dream that the farm would be a place where all people, regardless of your color, of your religion, uh, other issues, would come together and make our community better. So please review the documentation about uh, his legacy, review our farm sheet to find out what we're doing, and hopefully see you in 2019. First, I'd like to say that the farm really is a community farm, and without the community um, supporting us and backing us up, it wouldn't exist. Um, Kevin LaVale has been a huge, tremendous supporter of us, and um, Tom, um, Tom Yoratori, and as well as, um, um, I'm sorry, supervisor, supervisor as well, I'm sorry. Um, I really have to thank the Bethel um, church, though, for um, really standing their ground. Um, a lot of people, when they saw the, the land in disarray and, and um, abandoned, um, a lot of people came forward and wanted to purchase the property for their own well-being and put up condos or, you know, housing developments and stuff like that. But um, they stood their ground. They knew Mr. Hobbs's vision. Um, he wanted it to remain a farm. Um, the, um, and used for children as well. And um, they really stood their ground and, um, and made that vision come true. So um, I, I just really, they have my utmost respect as far as that goes. Um, with uh, The farm really is a community thing and it's not one person, it's not two people, it's not three people, it's all of us together. And um, I see a lot of faces out here that have been at the farm and that have helped out and I, I thank you for that. And um, you know, it's, it's a community thing and it's all run by volunteers and um, we're just trying to keep the vision um, going. I can, we all don't know what um, the afterlife is, but I can envision Mr. Hobbs leaning over the balcony of heaven, sometimes pulling his hair out, what are they doing? And uh, other times just having a beam in his eye and a smile across his face and just, um, you know, thanking God that his vision has come true. So I thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Bailey. Um, I just want to mirror what Larry has said that Anne is really the curator of the fort there. She really runs everything and it's unbelievable her strength and her power. And her, you know, the impetus behind doing this, the story that I heard was that 
she was farming at or doing some gardening at her house at one point, and I think she wanted to maybe increase or try to uh, uh, work a larger space of farm to be able to um, provide you know, fruits and vegetables. And I think down the street from her house, of course, is Hobbs Farm. So uh, in essence, she um, looked down the street and said, I wonder if I could either purchase or work or try to make something happen down there. Because at that time, I don't think it was a functioning farm because Mr. Hobbs had died. And um, uh, it, as she said, it became, um, it, it became just in disrepair. So um, she, I don't know who she spoke to, but she started working there at the farm. And when I say this woman has power and is very strong and, well, she could say bullheaded, but I'm saying she has compassion and empathy for everyone and anyone that works there. And mainly for the land and the dirt. Remember, the soil is the important thing to most of us. The soil holds the power because it not only feeds us, it also makes us grow. So in essence, um, Anne has given that farm the sunshine that it needs for everything to grow down on that farm. So she's made it work. My minor um, performance on the job is in construction. I do some painting there. I may do some uh, development, some of the uh, roofing. But I also get down in the dirt myself and also weed, grow, uh, water, you know, whatever's needed. So like Ann said before, there are faces here that have been to, at the farm. And we need more faces down at that farm that will come in and put in some time there. Even if it's an hour, even if it's 10 hours, we need bodies there. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Tom Lyons. Tom Lyons was a major contributor to the farm. And so Tom, thank you so much. And uh, Jen Ross also. Thank you, Jen. At this time, I'd like Supervisor Romaine, uh, Councilwoman Cartwright, to please join us in our presentation. To the Bethel Hobbs Farm today, this first day of February, this first day of Black History Month, is proclaimed throughout the town of Brookhaven as Bethel Hobbs Community Farm Day in the town of Brookhaven for the contribution you make. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, at this time, uh, we will have Dr. Georgette Greer Key, who, who will provide a Long Island migration, um, Long Island migrations for us. Thank you, Dr. Greer Key. Well, it's so quiet in here. And I'm guilty because I just snuck in that back room, I think, where the students were and took one of their brownies. Mm -hmm. I needed some sugar. So talking about um, Long Island migrations, did you get a lesson so far? What do we know about the Great Migration? Has anyone here participated in the Great Migration? Did anyone come in the second wave? Is there anyone here? Talk to me. No? Anyone's grandparents? No one? Does any, has anyone participated in the Great Migration? The second wave? Your grandparents? Did anyone come? OK, so wake up. Hello? Do we need to stand up and sit down, do a jumping jack? Wake up. It's Friday night, isn't it? What, you ever heard that song, Just Got Paid? We should be partying. OK? So did anyone, I saw some hands over here, did anyone's grandparents 
parents participate in the Great Migration? Okay, so now I see some hands. Wake up. And so when you think about the Great Migration, um, there were two waves of Great Migration, and now we have a third wave, which is the reverse Great Migration, where you have young folks like my sister, who went to uh, Clark Atlanta, she never came back. And so now she's lived in Atlanta more than she's lived here. So we have three waves of the Great Migration. So when you think of the Great Migration, what do we know about the Great Migration? We know that uh, many people moved around within our own country for greater opportunities, right? So, but we do know that these opportunities sometimes were a myth. But this is the first time that you'll see within your own country that you have to move within your own borders looking for opportunities. And those opportunities will happen because of Jim Crow. And sometimes these opportunities that they would look for, they would leave during the dark of night. So when I say the dark of night, what does this mean? Many of the southern cities did not want these people to leave. Because their cities would be decimated, people would be uh, leaving in droves, there would be nobody there to work. Could you imagine? A, a community just left, no one there. No young people, no one to work, no one to man the stores, no one to live in the houses, no one to turn over the crops that they planted. So that means a whole economic city, a whole economic community just collapsed. The whole slave economy that built the South decimated. And that was the only economic system that they had in the South. So that's why they had to leave under the dark at night. They didn't want anyone to leave. So, but when you see them coming to the different tracks, where did they go? Some of them went to the where? To the west. Some of them went to the Midwest, and then some of them came right here to Long Island, they came to the North. And when they came to the North, but well before they came to the North, before the Great Migration, we did have people here living in the suburbs on Long Island in places like Gordon Heights. We did have people living in Freeport in different places in rural areas. But we do see that people did start to come here in between 1910 uh, and the 1930s. We do see that people came to live right here. And when they came to live here, what kind of jobs did they have? They did have domesticated work. What they used to call, my, my aunt used to talk, tell me, we called Thursday girls. Anybody ever hear of this term, Thursday girls? Oh, I see somebody raising their hand. Thursday girls. And what were Thursday girls? They worked on the weekend, they stayed in. They lived in. They lived in and they worked in. They, they didn't go home. They worked over the weekend. They lived in the houses. They cleaned houses. They watched the children of others while they left their children at home and took care of someone else's home. Could you imagine leaving your family in the South and maybe sending back money? You would see in the newspaper, you would see letters being sent home to the South. Oh, you guys got to come up here because there's plenty of money to be made. They were able to work in the factories because people were not here. They were off in war. But you know when they came back, those people wanted their jobs back and they wanted you to be gone. So when you think of the Great Migration, the opportunities that were afforded to them, they were not always opportunities. And so when you see the communities that we live in now that some people like to coin as traditionally black, we know that they're not always traditionally black because they were by design a white flight. Yes, we do have traditionally black communities, but there are mainly two, three, four that we can name. So the Great Migration for us has given us plenty, but we can never forget. So when we celebrate, we celebrate, but we also remember the pain that has come with it, but we do have triumph and we do have far to go. But when we think about what it has done for us here, what are some of the other jobs? Yes, we worked in the factories. Yes, we did clamming. We worked in some of the other factories just Recently, we think of that we're now celebrating the 50th anniversary of Grumming, and we have some people that participated in that exhibition. So when we think of the great migration and our families that came up here, 
by way of Brooklyn, by way of Harlem, and made their way to Hempstead, and made their way out to Freeport, to Glen Clove, to Roslyn, to Freeport, to Babylon. And they made their way out here to Southampton. And where did they come from? South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. All these different places that they have come and planted their roots here on Long Island for a better opportunity. And we're still here. And that they came for work. And how did they come? I was told by my relatives that it was unbecoming for you to come and not be received by another family member, an older family. You didn't just get up and come because, oh, well, I heard it's opportunity. You had to be received by an elder in the family because aunt so-and-so was there. Oh, I see some heads shaking. So when you came, you came because aunt so-and-so was there and she's waiting for you because you had to have some eyes on you. Not only did you have to have some eyes on you, you came because you knew that if you needed help, that you can get it. I was told about um, another story by someone who lived in the Bronx. And you had realtors that tried to put somebody over in Cinema Richards. And she said, well, why are they going to take you all the way to Cinema Richards? Because, and of course, public transportation still isn't all that great out here. And she says, well, I can't get all the way to you in Cinema Richards, and I'm in the Bronx. So I think you need to revise that plan. So when you came, you had to be received by someone, by someone because it was respectable to do so. And then, of course, you had to have religion, because if you didn't, you were a heathen. So when we think about the Great Migration, the church, the black church, AME, AM Zion, Amen. Southern Baptists, you had to have a church. And you better believe you were in there all day on Sunday. And you had to be there definitely for Bible study. If you were Baptist, you were there on Wednesday. And if you were Kojic, you definitely there was on Tuesday and Thursday. And you had to be there on Friday. And you need to either be a deaconess and or evangelist. And you had to be on the choir. And by golly me, you better pay tithes. So when you think about the great migration, the traditions that we have, you also have to think about some of our food, and you will get into that a little bit later when we go over the fellowship with each other. And the traditions that we carry, not just from being African Americans, the traditions that follow us all the way from the motherland and from Africa. So when you think about the Great Migration, you also have to think about what else comes with it. People don't understand the food that we eat, and unfortunately, yes, there is a lot of fried food. but. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, I don't know if we had an opportunity as the commission, we did plan out some recipes that we wanted you to understand some of the food that is carried over that made it through the slave trade, that made it all the way from the, the transatlantic slave trade that came over with us. So when you think about the black IP that carries over not just from Africa, from Senegal, not just from Senegal, West Africa, but you could also trace it to the Jewish tradition, the black IP, which most of you don't like. If you like black IPs, raise your hand. That's because we got a lot of older people you're telling your age now. <laughs> because I didn't see not one young person raise their hand. Well, see, see you're just playing like you're young now. Because not one young person raised their hand. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, we need to give her an award. We got to give her an extra award, supervisor. <laughs> Only one young person raised their hand that like a black eyed pea. But see, I'm Geechee, and I grew up eating all kind of peas. Butter beans, lima beans, black eyed peas, red beans, gumbo, okra. You ate that in my household. These days, they eat french fries, pizza, whatever they want, chicken nuggets. No, you ate real food. But Lord, how mercy! I couldn't stand to see the chicken feet and smell the chick, the uh, the uh, what is it, the chitlins and the hog maws. But this is the food traditionally that we grew up with, and a lot of times you go on the internet, and I hope one day we incorporate a, a correction where we come together and we have some type of coding for our girls and our young people because they have a lot of misinformation about the food that we ate. Yes, there were some things that were scraps. 
But at the end of the day, our traditions are not just about the leftover scraps and food and the migration of what people did not want. Our traditions is a microcosm of who we are. And I say that our traditions is not just about the leftovers. It's about taking the best of what's left and making it something out of nothing. So when you think about us, we are the salt of the earth. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Georgette Grigke for that educational, inspiring, informative, and also very funny um, speech. So at this time, um, we are pleased to be joined uh, by music musicians from the Shiloh Temple Church of God in Christ, and we would ask that they come forward at this time. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Gregg. Amen. How are you all today? I need you to join me in one soul. Be in and out, all right?
give another hand to Cheryl. Thank you so much. She does so much to support our Black History program. And thank you for that beautiful selection. So at this time, it is my privilege to introduce um, our keynote speaker for 2019, Shadrach Boyachi. He has an amazing migration story from growing up, um, being born in Liberia, coming to this country, finding success in his own right, not just finding success, but going back to bring other people forward and lift other people up. And so what he has done with his career, uh, with his group, the, Tr the Truth Urban Theater Group, is go out into the world to inspire people, to uplift them, to encourage them, to speak the truth, to teach the truth. And we are so excited to have him here today. Um, he, his group is a 2018 Emmy Award winner. It is such an honor to have him here. And we'd like to, at this time, welcome to the podium our 2019 keynote speaker and honoree, Shadrach Boyachi. Good evening. good evening. Oh, come on. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. OK. All right. Um, it's an honor to be here. Good evening to you guys. All right. There we go. OK. You guys are smiling. I was looking at each other. I was like, y'all going to smile today? OK. That's awesome. Um, so I want to get all right onto it, because um, I know we don't have too much time. It's interesting. Um, I, I, I travel quite a bit. I'm a speaker with Scholastic. Um, and Harcourt, and nobody ever gets my last name right, ever. Um, can everybody say Boache? Still, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, you know, I went to school. My father used to say to me, "Say Boiki, Boiki." So I went from Boiki to Buyaka. That's what some people would actually say. And then once I got to college, I'm like, no, 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 it's Boache. I had to remember that my name was Shadrach, not Kwame Boache, because that's what my grandmother, that's the name, that, that middle name my grandmother gave me. Now, not Kwame Boache. And it stands, it means quite a bit. Now, I'm not quite sure why my father named me Shadrach, <laughs> because I have two little brothers. Actually, I have two brothers. One name is Eric. <laughs> the other name is Kevin. And for some reason, he took a look at me and said, I'm going to name you Shad, right? It's going to be a, an experiment. I'm going to see what happens with you. Now, many of you already know what the name Shadrach means. Many of you, right? You guys know where it comes from, right? Some of you? You guys probably know the three lads. All right, we're going we're gonna to scream it out first. Shadrach. Somebody said Billy Goat. Y'all need to stop. Somebody said a Billy Goat. <laughs> Now, I, I have been saved three times in a particular place. And before I get into it, um, I don't think the slide, um, we're, they're trying to work out. No, it's not going to work? OK, that's fine. I have some clips for you, some, um, some pictures for you, but it doesn't seem like it's going to work. So I'm going to flow. Um, I have been covered, and I want you to look at the person next to you without scaring them, and I want you to say something to them. I want you to say, I will cover you. I right, say it and look back. Don't, don't scare them. The reason why I'm even saying I will cover you is because I believe in something called a constant. I've been covered three times inside a classroom. I've been saved three times inside a classroom, literally. The very first time I was saved was in Liberia during the Civil War. Now, at the time, every single Ghanaian, which we're just actually where I'm originally from, I'm Ghanaian, every single Ghanaian was to be shot automatically. And so my mother is carrying me checkpoints, and she's starting to see people get shot left and right. And this was a woman that's never seen war before. Now, this is how brutal the war was. I want you to imagine two 12-year-old boys 
One with an AK-47, another with another AK-47. They put the AK-47 down to pick up a machete. And they see a pregnant woman walking by. One says, I bet that is that baby in there is a boy. And another one says, no, I bet it's a girl. And then they say, let's go find out. That's the kind of world my mother was trying to escape. And so one day, the rebels had told everybody in the community that if everybody gets out past 6 o'clock, you're going to be shot. No questions asked. So at 6 o'clock, my mother knows already what time it is. You've got to get into any room you can find. She ends up getting into a classroom out of all places. And in that classroom, there were 50 people laying down waiting to see the next day. My mother gets down with them. She's laying down. And every single baby's quiet. Every single child is quiet. Every mother, every father, everyone is quiet, except for Shadrach. Shadrach is the only baby crying. Shadrach needs his diaper changed. Shadrach needs to be fed. And so now every single person is looking directly at my mom, and they're saying, shut this baby up or we're all going to die. And now my mother did something that a lot of people don't tend to do. She decided to do, she decided to listen to the voice inside of her. And as soon as this rebel was actually coming in, what she basically did at that moment is she began to listen to this voice that was saying, be calm, be still, don't move. As soon as the rebel was walking in, my mother realized that she had two choices. She could either suffocate me until I die or risk every single life in there. The moment that rebel walked in, my mother shut everybody's voice out. And right at that moment, she took a cloth she had wrapped around her, and she put it over me. And for some reason, I stopped crying. The man walked around the room with his AK-47, and he did not see one single person. It's as if because my mother listened to that voice, that call, that tone, that voice inside of her, every single person was covered. The man walked around. My mother said, this man walked right by you. He was there for minutes and you still weren't, you still weren't crying. When you put a cough over a child who's screaming, what are they gonna end up doing? They're gonna scream more. This woman, this man walked right next to my mom Right by me with his AK-47, he looked around, he still could not see anyone. And he walked out. Fast forward, I'm in the United States. I'm left back twice, placed in special ed. Nobody's asking what my story is, not one person. When I came to, this, I came to the United States, I, had, I was just beginning first grade, just beginning. I was still, I didn't even know my ABCs are one, two, three. But because I was eight years old, they pushed me right into the fourth grade. Left back twice, placed in special ed, and of course the kids are calling me African booty scratcher. I still don't understand what that means. As soon as they see the African kid, hey, hey Shadrach. It seems to me that people in the United States, a lot of people think of two things when they think of Africa. Lion King and coming to America. Especially at that time. Now, imagine a kid going through this, and now he's left back twice, he's placed in special ed, because nobody really wants to know his story. And then one day, this one day in eighth grade, this one teacher comes up to him, and while he's writing something on the board, his teacher named Miss Murphy, writing something on the board, I'm responding to what Miss Murphy is saying. She comes right to me, she looks at my work, and she says to me, Shad, you wrote this? You are a great writer. I'm like, what? Because nobody ever said that to me. Usually, when I look at my work, they put red marks over it. But this woman, the very first time she sees me, she says to me that you are a great writer. I mean, she saw all the grammatical errors, she saw all my mistakes, but the very first time she sees me, she says, you are a great writer. How beautiful is it the very first time you meet somebody, you compliment them. 
Because what she was really saying to me is, I know all the mistakes you've made, but this is what I love about you. And with that, just like that classroom back in Liberia, she covered me. In fact, she covered me so well that that year I went from reading at a second grade level to an eighth grade level. On top of that, she came up to me one day and she told me, Shad, I want you to write an essay about your life, the things you've been through, and I want you to just bring it right back. There's a contest going on. And I said, okay. Gave it to her. One day I'm sitting in the cafeteria, I get called to the principal's office, and there is my father, the principal, and Miss Murphy. And I'm looking like Miss Murphy, like, you know, we, we could have talked about this, whatever it was, my father. Here. My father gonna be like, what you know that look they give you when they get called out of work? I'm like, I've been good, I've been good. The principal looks over at me and says, Shad, you remember that essay you wrote a couple months back? And I was like, yeah. And she says to me, you're one of nine to win across the country. I always get chills when I say this because I always imagine Ms. Murphy sitting next to me saying, you did it, and I just want to tell her we did it. This woman covered me with her words. She covered me verbally. And that same year, not only did I receive a scholarship, but I also received, Muhammad Ali read my essay, and he sent me boxing gloves, signed by him, and he also sent me a letter. What I'm basically trying to say is, is that if you really listen to that voice inside, because that's what Ms. Murphy did, that was her first year doing this. If you listen enough, miracles happen. Amen. This thing happened. This, three times I was saved in the classroom. On the third time I was saved, I was actually trying to cover another kid who was going through a lot of things I was going through. And the one interesting thing about this one kid was that her mom would always try to stop me whenever I'm walking. This is, remember, I'm a refugee, so I walk places. I really don't, I didn't have my, um, I didn't have my green card, nothing. So here I am walking around, I'm, I'm traveling, I'm doing all these great things, and I still don't even have my papers together. And this woman will stop me. This is when this kid was, I started working with this kid in, 12, in sixth grade. When he got to 12th grade, every time I walk, mother will stop me and say, Shad, where are you going? I'm like, I'm, you need a ride? No. This one day I go to the DMV, and they tell me, you're not even in the system anymore. And the lawyer tells me, you better get married to somebody soon. Because you can't make it out here. Somebody told me, you better stay indoors and don't go out, don't get into any trouble. And I'm like, how am I, and I'm, and I'm calling every lawyer up, these people are saying 15,000, I'm like, what? I'm going week after week after week, I'm, 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 I feel like for the first, I'm like, wait, I grew up here. And then this one time, I felt this voice telling me, don't move, don't do anything. And I'm like, what? He's don't move. But, but I'm being told to call. No, don't move. Don't do anything. The week that I didn't move or do anything, I'm walking again. And the lady walks up. This lady's driving again. But this time, she says to me, get in the car. She didn't even ask. She said, get in the car. I got in the car. And I said, you know, Ms. Diaz, I've always wanted to ask, what is your occupation? She said, oh, I work for the immigration office. Ms. Diaz, I have this problem. What? It can be fixed right away. I got it. You don't even have to pay for this. Within four months, not only did I receive the green card, uh, about a few weeks later, I was actually on set with Spike Lee. Right after. And I needed to get that card in order to be able to work on a Netflix show with him. When we listen to the voice inside, miracles happen. And when we cover one, we cover all. My mother covered me. Miss Murphy covered me. And because these amazing women covered me, 
I get to cover thousands of people. And while I was covering another child that I didn't even know, her mother would later on cover me. She was already in place to cover me. Years before, she would keep asking me for rides, and I said no until that one day, she said, get in. And boom. Which led me to receiving the Emmy, and also now being, um, still working with Spike to this day. And so, if I really truly want to leave you with something to under, for you to fully understand that, it is not by chance. It is simply not by chance that all of these things took place. And if you want me to clear it up even more, when I was a child, a man came up to my mother and said, before your child is born, I want you to take this honey and put it in your child's tongue. My mom did, that man ended up dying in a war. This happened five years ago. My mother reached out to me and said, Shad, there's this woman who called me and she was blind. She, she sings and she called me and she said, I know you're a seamstress and I want you to sew my clothes. Why don't you sew my clothes? My mom says, okay. And so this is so weird. The woman is talking to my mom. The mom says, ma'am, I think we have the same tongue. Now my mom lives in Europe right now. And what that basically means, we speak the same native language. And the, man, the woman says, yes, I believe we do. And, the, and the, my mom says, ma'am, where are you from? She said, oh, I, I live in a place called, I lived in a place called Rara. And my, ma my mom says, oh, I know a man who lived in a place called Rara. And my mom said the man's name, and the woman says, oh, that's my father. <laughs> then my mom asked the woman, where do you live? Woman said it, and come out, find out, they actually live five minutes away from one another in Europe. And they've been living five minutes away from each other for years. It is not by chance. When we cover one, we cover all. Please keep that in mind. No matter where you're from, no matter who you are, no matter where you go. When we talk about migration, we're not just talking about just going from one place to another. We are connected in so many ways. And when we sink that in, we become a beacon in our community. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, look at here. A picture. <laughs> Um, I also want to just, uh, just thank you all. Just first and foremost, I want you guys all to know that so much of what I said was f for you. And I want you all to remember that. Please hold on to that because it's so, so important. Um, if you guys like to know a little bit more about the company, about us, first of all, my name is Shadrach Bracci, and the theater company is The Truth UTG. You can find us on social media at The, Th the Truth UTG. And I want to give a shout out to all the members who are here. Um, thank you all again. God bless you. Okay, so at this time we'd ask to like, uh, like to ask Supervisor Romaine and Councilwoman Cartwright uh, and the members of the Black History Commission uh, to please join us as we present uh, the award to Mr. Boachi and Noel. If all the members of the commission could please come forward at this time. Okay. Thank you. We want to say thank you so much for your inspirational words. And let's see if I can pronounce your name properly. Shadrach Nana Kwame Wachi. Well, today is your day in the town of Brookhaven. And it will always be your day here in the town of Brookhaven. We want to say thank you for not only um, going to school in the town of Brookhaven, am I correct? Uh, going to school in the town of Brookhaven, but continuing to give back to our youth and giving such an inspirational word, not only to the children, but to each and every one of us. I looked around the room and I saw everyone's face. You captured everyone. So we say thank you, thank you, thank you. to say something. Say thank you. Say thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, nah. <laughs>
<laughs> Noel had it. <laughs> okay, so we have reached the point in our program where we have some very special honorees that we'd like to recognize at this time. I would like to call to the podium uh, Mr. Clayton Hudson and doc, uh, Dr. Corinne Graham, who are going to present our 2019 Academic Excellence Awards to our students. Please give them a round of applause for our students. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, we had such a wonderful time so far. Let's hear it. Awesome. So today we're here to celebrate our fantastic students, right? Let's give them a round of applause. Um, congratulations and much continued success. Uh, make sure that you chat with folks. It's important. We were in there, we were doing a little dialogue. I'm sure you got to meet a couple of you know, from new friends that you didn't know before from different schools. Just keep what, whatever it is you're doing and much blessing. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to ask the young the students to participate. And we've already, they already know that. So they are going to come up one at a time, give their name, their school, and what they're going to pursue. And remember, they are all seniors and are going to graduate. So we're going to, for academic excellence. So we're going to start off, I think they went by school. So why don't we start off with Bellport High School? Hi, I'm Gabriella Kaler. Um, I go to Bellport High School, and I'm planning to study accounting in college. Hi, I'm Maya McCullough. I go to Bellport High School, and after high school, I plan to study theater and directing. Thank you. My name is Rebecca Ofori. I attend Bellport High School, and I intend to study medicine. My name is Ayana Hodge, and I'm from Santa Reach High School, and I plan to uh, major in health science. Hi, my name is Matthew Jones, and I plan to pursue an education in psychology. My name is Gabrielle Parfait, and I plan to pursue a doctorate in pharmacy. Hi, my name is John Rivera, and after, oh, I go to Santa Beach High School, and after high school, I plan to study architecture. Hi, my name is Tommy Turner. I go to Center H High School and I'm going to study business. Uh, my name is Joshua Washington. I go to Center H High School and I plan to study computer science. Hi, my name is Skylar Pemberton, and I go to Santa Marcia's High School, and I plan to study international relations. Hi, my name is Brianna Jean Baptiste. I attend Comswag High School and will be majoring in pre law. Hi, my name is Devon. Uh, I attend Longwood High School and I plan to uh, major in biology and be a cardiologist one day. Hi, my name is Rihanna Headley. I attend Longwood High School and I plan to major in nutrition and dietetics. Hello, 
my name is Marissa Cassie, and I hope to um, pursue a career as a nurse practitioner. Hi, my name is Rod Pohl. I go to Longwood High School, and I plan to pursue a career in orthopedic surgery. My name is Xavier Harvey, and I'm going to major in biomedical engineering. Hi, my name is Zaria Brathwaite. Um, I attend Sachem North, and I plan to study psychology. Hi, I'm Alex Jean. I attend Sage North High School and I plan to study chemistry. Hi, my name is Nicole Kondo. I attend Sage North High School and I plan to pursue my future career as a registered nurse. My name is Latach Gui Sophia. I'm from William Floyd High School, and I plan on majoring in computer information technology. Hi, my name is Mia Morell, and I'm from William Floyd, and I plan to study in computer programming. Hi, my name is Zariana Brown, and I attend Longwood High School, and I want to study criminal justice. Hi, I'm Malika Desiree, and I come from Newfield High School, and I plan to pursue an education in art conservation. Hi, my name is Jennifer Mazzobi, and I come from Newfield High School, and before I say I'm going to pursue, I wanted to thank everyone for coming, and thank God for giving us this opportunity to represent African American culture, and represent the future generations, and represent people who are going to change the world. Um, I would like to pursue um, a neurosurgeon, become a neurosurgeon to help other countries, especially ones that need help of healthcare and can't receive healthcare, to have the opportunity to live healthy and long lives. Hi, my name is Rachel Edwards. I attend Patrick Medford High School and I plan to major in marketing. My name is Anthony Randall, and I'm coming from Patman, and I would like to study environmental design. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a, a standing round of applause to our students. Thank you. Thank you so much. So at this time, we are, have come to the conclusion of our program. Once again, we would like to th thank each and every one of you for joining us uh, for tonight's Black History Month celebration. We would like to thank all the students, and there, uh, there were some additional students who unfortunately were not able to be here this evening, but you do see their names uh, listed in the program. And we'd like to take just a moment, all the parents, all the grandparents, all the families of the students, would you please uh, stand to be acknowledged? We'd like to recognize you for supporting your students and for being the backbone for them. Thank you. Thank you to all the parents. 
the parents and the families, uh, you're the reasons why your students are the successes that we are. So congratulations to each and every one of you. We are so proud of you. Um, on behalf of the Black History Commission, um, I would like to thank all of the members on the commission uh, who are incredible, who work hard every single year um, to make not just this program, but to make sure that throughout Brookhaven we are sharing uh, black history and culture. So Janet Batten, who could not be with us tonight, Dr. Corrine Graham, Miles Green, Dr. George at Gurkey, Clayton Hudson, Leah Jefferson, Lorraine Richardson McRae, and Tracy Todd Hunter. We thank each and every one of you for your service um, on the Black History Commission. Thank you. At this time, um, I'm going to ask Reverend Gregory Leonard um, from Bethel AME Setauket to please come forward. He is going to give us a benediction uh, and also a blessing of the food, at which time we're going to invite everyone to the cafeteria for our cultural food tasting. Um, I would like to ask everyone from the Bethel Hobbs Farm um, to please join in the front uh, for a photograph immediately following the conclusion of the program uh, with the commission members. Um, Reverend Leonard, thank you. Thank you very much. It is important to remember our roots, remember how we are connected to one another in different generations in different ways, and it is always so important to build bridges to one another within our own culture and across culture to reach out our hand in our hearts to make a difference in this world. So I'm very proud of you young people. I know the road is not going to be easy, but you will make it. So tonight, we as a congregation here cover you with God's blessings. And know that one day you will have the opportunity to help and cover someone else. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for this gathering here this evening where we stop and we remember from whence we came. We remember the blessings that we have because we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. And Almighty God, one day others will stand on our shoulders. And Lord, we will keep moving up and forward. Lord, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Then, Lord, we thank you for the food that has been prepared, but ever more so, we thank you for the sweet fellowship we have together with one another. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen and amen. Thank you, Reverend Leonard. And actually, before everyone leaves, uh, we do have one additional presentation. Um, we rec recognized our keynote honoree tonight, but we would also like to recognize the members. Uh, there are some members of the Truth Urban Theater Group who were able to join us tonight. Um, so those members of the Truth Urban Theater Group, if you would please uh, come to the podium, we'd like to also acknowledge you as well. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming them. Um, so a few of the members could join us today. We're actually getting ready for a production next week. Um, so there's just been a lot of work, but um, three, of, three of the members are able to join us. And um, I just want to just, just give a hand of applause for them because they've really been doing so much work. And um, I really also want to get the time um, to honor them. So um, um, I... Get certificates? Okay, so um, I, you guys are gonna get them a little later. Take a picture. Oh, yes, okay, beautiful. Don't wanna take too much more of your time. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for coming. Please join us in the cafeteria for our cultural food tasting. <laughs>